Welcome to part 6 of this series of presentations on drill string and drilling dynamics. It's the last one that relates to the axial, rotational and fluid dynamics of the drilling process. The seventh pre presentation is on acoustics and then we get on to lateral statics and dynamics. It's also split into two parts, of which this is the first. I'm going to be talking about auto drillers, which is a subject that has surprisingly little published on it. Normally, the controlled variable for auto drillers is weight, and I will discuss their behaviour and how they depend on the filters used on the auto driller input measurements. When drilling with a motor, it is common to try and drill at constant pressure, and in the second part of this talk, I will repeat the theoretical analysis for motor drilling with pressure control before talking about how auto drillers can affect stick slip and finishing with a discussion of top drive control algorithms for reducing stick slip. Okay, let's get going on auto drillers. This is what you're going to learn about auto drillers. How they work, how the auto driller on the surface interacts with what's happening downhole, and how, when drilling with a motor, weight control differs from pressure control. There are a number of questions that one might ask about auto drillers, of which these are some. I hope by the end of this presentation they will be at least partially answered. What does good auto driller operation look like? What are the best parameters and how to find them? Auto drillers are a control system, and control systems may or may not be stable. And finally, do they have anything to do with stick slip? First, a reminder of how weight is applied to the bit during deep drilling. The weight of the drill string far exceeds the amount of weight that is needed for drilling, so the drill string is hanging in the mast and is lowered into the well, with the tension in the drilling line such that some of the weight of the drill string is borne by the bit, and the rest is carried by the drilling line. The cable is on a drum, and there is a brake that controls the speed at which the drilling line is let out. This can be done by a human, the driller, who watches the deadline anchor tension to determine how fast or how much line to let out, or by an automated control system, the auto driller. In a normal auto driller, there are two nested control systems. The outer loop is to control the desired parameter, such as the weight. Of course, at the surface, what you are measuring is not weight, but tension, but this can easily be calibrated to weight by zeroing at the tension when the bit is off bottom. The inner loop uses the brake to control the drum rotation speed, and hence the speed of the travelling block from which the drill string is suspended. This is a very fast control loop, and I shall be assuming that it is instantaneous and perfect, which is obviously a simplification, but a reasonable one. We shall see that the outer loop takes seconds or more to operate, whereas the inner one will be much faster. Let's revisit the simple axial dynamics. The difference between surface and bit axial velocity is proportional to the rate of change of weight. The bit velocity is proportional to the weight. The auto driller seeks a desired weight by controlling the surface velocity. The way it normally does this is with a proportional integral controller. This controller is aiming to get the weight to the desired weight, WD. It has two terms. A proportional term, which changes sign depending on whether the weight is above or below the desired weight, and then an integral term, which is constant at the desired weight. Why do we need an integral term? Very loosely speaking, it's a kind of memory term. But more importantly, if it wasn't there, the system would not converge to the right weight. Let's look at what would happen if we just had proportional control, no integral term. There's only one parameter of the controller, the gain A. We can combine the auto driller control equation with the drilling dynamics equation to get the simple differential equation you see in the second line. Up to the addition of a constant, solutions to this look like a decaying exponential. Where the time constant is the drill string compliance lambda divided by the sum of the controller gain and the rock drillability. So whatever the initial conditions, the system will converge exponentially to a constant weight, with the time constant increasing as the drill string gets longer. But what weight will it converge to? 
At equilibrium, the rate of change of weight is zero, and hence the weight is the desired weight, WD, times the proportional gain A, divided by the sum of the proportional gain and the rock drillability, i.e. not the desired weight. Adding the integral term solves the problem. There are now two controller parameters, and as is conventional, I am writing the proportionality in front of the integral term as the proportional gain A divided by a time, tor. To get a differential equation, we need to differentiate, resulting now in this second order differential equation. If the system reaches equilibrium, then both the first and second derivative of weight with time are zero, and the weight is the desired weight. So if it can reach equilibrium, then this will be at the desired weight. Solving the differential equation is easy, using a Laplace transform. So ignoring the constant term, this is the differential equation and its general solution for some constants a and b, where the two x's, x plus and x minus, are given by the expression on the right. In general, they may be complex, but their real parts are always positive, which means that the system is always stable. It will always converge, here to zero, in general, to the desired weight. So how does the behaviour change as the parameters change? We have two parameters that are part of the below ground drilling system, the compliance and the drillability, and two control parameters, the gain A and the integral time tor. If the decay time constants x are complex, their real part is an inverse time, which is the convergence time of the system, and is independent of the integral time. It's the compliance divided by twice the sum of the proportional gain of the drillability, and this response time will grow linearly with drill string length. Looking at the square root part of the axis, it changes sign depending on the ratio of the response time to the integral time tor. So if the response time is much longer than the integral time, then the axis have an imaginary component, which means that the weight will oscillate as it converges. If on the other hand the response time is much less than the integral time, both axes will be real, and there will be no oscillation, just exponential convergence. So obviously, if the rock and rotation speed are constant, the system will go from exponential convergence to oscillatory convergence as the drill string gets longer. For a short drill string, or one with a very large integral time, there will be exponential convergence. If you decide to double the weight on bit, the convergence will look like this. The numbers on the scales are arbitrary, but indicative of time in seconds and weight in thousand pounds force. If you take the same drill string and reduce the integral time, the system becomes oscillatory. If the desired weight is doubled, the weight overshoots and oscillates. If the integral time were reduced further, the system would converge in the same time, but the period of the oscillations would be reduced and the amplitude of the oscillations would increase. Both these illustrations are for increasing weight, and there's a reason for that. In general, increasing and decreasing weight are different. When you are at equilibrium, so the weight is the desired weight, then the surface velocity, the surface ROP, is the integral term. If you increase the desired weight, the proportional term is immediately positive, and so the surface velocity is increased. However, if the desired weight is reduced, the proportional term will decrease the desired surface velocity, and if the proportional term is sufficiently large, the desired surface velocity will go negative. But drilling with a normal drilling rig the surface velocity cannot go negative. To lower the block, the brake is used, but to raise the block, a motor has to be engaged. So if the desired velocity is negative, the actual velocity just stays at zero until the weight has drilled off passively. This happens if the weight decrease is sufficiently large, or if there is a large proportional gain A. So for large A, increasing weight, there is one response time involving the proportional gain, but for decreasing weight, only the drilling and drill string parameters matter. Is there an optimum set of parameters? What does optimum mean? It's subjective, of course, but what would be pleasing would be for the system to converge as fast as possible and not to overshoot or oscillate too much. This all depends crucially on the integral time, one of the control parameters. If it is low, the system will be underdamped 
and oscillate as it converges. If it is high, then it is overdamped and it takes much longer to reach a steady state. Is there a sweet spot? Not too big, not too small, but just right? Well, yes, of course. If the square root term is neither positive nor negative, the system reaches equilibrium as fast as possible without oscillating. Close to the sweet spot, there's not much difference, so you just have to be close. Now, if you buy or rent an auto driller, the user is given some scope in setting the controller parameters, but not complete freedom. There is the hazard that the driller would just keep fiddling around and might end up breaking things. Normally, you have some scope in adjusting the proportional gain within limits, but not the integral time. Now, you can get to a sweet spot with the integral time constant just by reducing the proportional gain, but that will also make the system slower and slower to react. There is a large additional complication, though, when going from this idealised model to auto drillers as actually implemented. The weight has to be filtered before going into the controller. There's noise on the measurement, and we don't want the surface velocity jumping around in response to it. If we denote the filter and its Laplace transform by g, then instead of a quadratic equation to solve, we end up with one involving the Laplace transform of the filter. The dynamics come from finding the solutions to this, which in general is not going to be possible analytically. But looking at stability turns out to be much more straightforward, in particular looking for solutions which are at the boundary of stability. If we plot solutions versus system parameters, there will be a boundary of stability, where on one side the solution is stable, with a negative real part, and unstable with a positive real part on the other side. Right on the boundary, the solution will be pure imaginary, oscillating, at an angular frequency omega. Making S pure imaginary, and writing the transform of G as the sum of a real and imaginary part. We end up with two real equations for the gain A and integral time tor in terms of the real and imaginary parts of G, the oscillation angular frequency omega, and the drilling parameters k and lambda. If we rearrange, it is convenient to non-dimensionalize the frequency omega using the integral time tor, and we end up with an equation for the ratio of the rock drillability to the proportional constant, and another for the ratio of the drill-off time to the integration time. Once you know the filter, you can choose values for theta and substitute them into the equation. If both right-hand sides are positive, then there are values of k, a, lambda and tor, for which the system is on the boundary of stability. This is best illustrated with a simple example. A simple low-pass filter is a boxcar average, just the average of the signal over the preceding time, capital T. We will non-dimensionalize the averaging time, capital T, and substitute for S, and get GR and GI in terms of the non-dimensional frequency, theta, and the non-dimensional averaging time, R. Finally, we have explicit expressions for K over A, the normalized inverse gain of the controller, and the ratio of the drill-off time to the integration time. Each value of theta gives a pair of values of these two ratios, so we can plot these as lines using the two ratios, the normalized inverse gain and the normalized inverse integration time, as axes. I've chosen a value of R of 3 8 as this is within the range of values used in commercial auto drillers. Physically, we know as the gain goes to zero, the system will become more stable. So the stable region is above the top blue line, and the unstable region below. So whereas with no filter on the weight, the system was unconditionally stable, now for some values of the gain and integral time, the system is unstable. Let's see how the stability changes as parameters are changed. Increasing the proportional gain moves downwards, so stability is reduced. Going into harder rock moves diagonally downwards as K over, K over A decreases, but the drill-off time increases. Increasing hole length along a drill string or reducing the integral time moves right, so increasing stability. It is interesting to look at this plot on different axes. 
This plot uses linear axes, but instead we can cover a much wider parameter range with a log-log plot. Obviously, only a small proportion of these parameter ranges are physically reasonable, but it does show how the stability diagram is actually extremely complicated. As k over, k over a decreases, there are more and more instabilities. One of the issues with autodriller behaviour is that the behaviour can change suddenly when the rock changes and the rock drillability changes. There are autodrillers that try and adjust for this using a form of autoscaling. In this form of the controller, everything is normalised. The weight terms on the right are normalised with respect to the desired weight, here W0. To explain the velocity scaling on the left side, I should add an extra fact about autodrillers, which is normally they will switch from weight control to speed control if the velocity is too high. So there is a user-determined maximum ROP, a maximum rate at which the travelling block will go down while drilling. So as you see, the surface velocity is normalised with respect to a scaling velocity, which is an offset. And that offset is a fraction of the maximum ROP setting for the autodriller, and some average of the past surface velocity, i.e. a low-pass filtered version of the surface velocity. There are now two low-pass filters, the G we had before and F as well. The system is clearly non-linear, but we can still look at the linear stability around a fixed set of parameters. The initial condition is that the system is in equilibrium at weight W0 and ROP V0 connected by the drillability. Gamma is a dimensionless ratio between 0 and 1. The filter F has a Laplace transform too, and when the equivalent analysis is performed, we get two very similar but more complicated equations. As before, one is for the drill off time divided by the integral time, but the other is now for the gain divided by gamma. Since gamma depends on the rate of penetration, it still depends implicitly on the rock drillability K. In the graphs that follow, I am not using boxcar filters. F and G are simple, realistic, low-pass filters for this application, but I'm afraid I can't tell you exactly what they are. Let's start with the case of gamma equal to zero, or equivalently, the offset velocity tends to infinity. This is exactly the, the analysis you have just seen, except with a different low-pass filter G. The diagram looks very similar, though with fewer stability boundaries. The y-axis scaling is with respect to gamma, which looks a bit odd as gamma is zero, but both A and gamma are tending to zero, as V offset tends to infinity, so the limit is the conventional unscaled autodriller. Let's jump quickly to a value of gamma of 0.65. There is a dashed blue line, as well as a red line, but they overlie. The stability diagram is close to identical to a gamma of zero. Now, increase gamma very slightly. At gamma equals 0.6888, the diagram is practically identical. But for gamma equals 0.689, an unstable region has appeared from lower right, in red. Over the small parameter range from 0.689 to 0.75, the unstable region grows to being the large area enclosed by the black line on the right. Finally, as gamma approaches 1, i.e. no offset velocity, for low proportional gain, the boundary of the unstable region approaches a vertical line where the drill-off time equals the integral time. Plotting on the log-log axes shows nicely how the unstable region appears at a particular value of gamma, but it's not obvious what this means for actual drilling parameters. If we look at the stability plot for one value of gamma, and I've taken 0.85 here, there are three instability zones. But there is also a hidden parameter, namely the frequency of the oscillation at the stability boundary. Another way of looking at this is to plot the oscillation frequency on the x-axis, and then the two parameters as functions of this dimensionless oscillation frequency. We end up with the three instability zones swapped around. The instability zone A, on the right in slide 28, is a low-frequency instability, 
when the ratio of the drill-off time to the integral time is too high. The zone B is a high frequency instability when the proportional gain is too high. Finally, there is an unphysical region at very high frequency that comes from high gain and an ultra-low drill-off time. That was a log-log plot. Back in the linear world, only the zones A and B are on the graph. We can have instability for two qualitative reasons. The proportional gain is too high, or that the drill-off time is too long. All of that was for particular filter choices on a linear and an auto-scaled auto-driller. But what this does demonstrate, I hope, is that auto-driller stability analysis is pretty straightforward when drilling with weight as the control parameter. While theoretical unfiltered auto-drillers are unconditionally stable, adding filters to the weight can introduce instability for high values of the proportional gain. Auto-scaled auto-driller stability behaviour depends critically on the rescaling offset, and having a low offset can result in an additional instability mode when the integration time is less than the drill-off time. That was all for weight control. It's all more interesting with pressure control for which you need to watch part 6b.